Pastor God Boyman, guys. Uh, if you live in the West Coast, so God will be part of the Staten Island ministry there. So definitely pull them on in and encourage them. God will be working powerfully there. Um, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. All right. If you're our guest here this morning, we're going to continue our series on the book of Genesis. And I think for us, this is huge because Genesis is where it all starts. The Old Testament really helps us understand what God's people went through and their relationship with Him so we can grow in our walk with Him as well. Now, today we're going to really study out one of the greatest men in history. Our father, our patriarch in the faith, Abraham. You with me here? And so, really, what was most noteworthy about Abraham was his faith. Um, not only is his faith in God ad admired by both Jews and Christians, his example is even held in high esteem by Muslims. That, that's how much the example of Abraham has even gone to other religions. You with me here? And so the Bible constantly calls us back to his faith, back to his example. And so the title of the message today is simply the faith of Abraham. Amen? We need to apply that and see where our faith is today. But first, before we jump in here, let's take a look over in Hebrews 11. And let's take a look at the biblical definition of faith. Because I think sometimes we kind of forget what faith is all about. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says this. Now faith is being what? Sure. sure. Now this is, this is huge. You remember those commercials with like the deodorant? Right? Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. Is that, was it the green commercial? Sure. If you're sure, raise your hand if you're sure. Right? See, what, what, when you're sure of something, you're confident. Right? You're at peace. Yeah, like, yeah, working hard, but oh, it smells great. Right? Well, in the same way, it says faith is being sure. Sure of what? Sure of what we hope for. Uh, we really believe and expect that, that God's promises are going to come true. And certain of what we do not see. Are we really sure and certain in the power of God? You do not see God necessarily right here, right now, although creation declares Him. But are you sure of that? Confident you're walking with Him, that He's walking with you. This is what the ancients were commended for. Well, let's take a look at down in verse 6. It says here, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. Which means that you can do a lot of stuff, but if you don't really believe that God has the power to do what he says he's going to do, then ultimately, it really is meaningless. If you're sharing your faith, but you don't really have faith to share, then God doesn't please God. You're just inviting people out to a, a, a discussion or inviting people out to a, a building. But you don't have the faith to really believe that they can come out. You don't have the faith to believe they can become Christians. Are you with me here, guys? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe, number one, He exists, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Amen. There are a lot of people that go to church, put on clothes, sit down in a pew, thinking that that pleases God. Right? That does not please God. Warming a seat does not please God. Putting on nice clothes does not please God. Come on, bro. It's our faith that pleases God. Amen. Faith it says here that He exists. Because yeah. if He exists, then I've got to check myself about how I live. Yeah. Oh. And number two, that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Huh. I think if you're a disciple, if you're a true Christian this morning, we understand that we believe that God exists, but sometimes we forget. We forget that He rewards us if we earnestly seek Him. When's the last time you felt rewarded by God? When's the last time you thought, man, you know what? God has blessed me according to my righteousness. Not because I'm awesome, but because, you know what? Because I've tried to do my best for Him, He's like, bro, I've taken care of you. I got you. You know, I think about the hardness right now. I think about Wes and Debbie. I, I remember first meeting Wes. <laughs> They can become Christians too. <laughs> and so he became a Christian. And it's amazing. When you become part of the kingdom of God, look how God blesses you. You become a disciple. Next thing you know, he gets married to an awesome sister, Debbie. And now they just gave birth to their first son, Wyatt. <laughs> Only in the kingdom of God can you be rewarded like that. Are you with me here? Yeah. And so we got to really ask ourselves do we really believe that God exists, but that he also wants to reward you? It's, 
yes, you don't deserve it, but he wants to reward you anyway. Are you with me here? Reward us with the religion, not only reward us with our salvation, i.e., that's the most important thing. Are you with me here? But to know that we can have the brothers and sisters in our lives that can have those true, real relationships. Yeah. And not the fakeness of the world. Are you with me here? Yeah. Well, today we're going to examine um, Abraham's faith. Turn over to Genesis chapter 12 here. We're going to see that faith is not blind. It is not based on nothing. You can be intelligent and be faithful. The object of our faith is Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Our God who is omnipresent, which means everywhere in spirit. Because if he was everywhere in a physical form, we couldn't exist. Right? He's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, and he's omniscient, all-knowing. That is the God we serve. And so we need to be sure and certain that our hope in God is not in vain. Come on, bro. And so, it's interesting because I always, I always ask people, they say, well, do you have faith? No, I don't have faith. I'm not sure you do. You have faith that there's going to be air when you wake up in the morning to breathe, but you can't see it. Why is it we, you have faith that when you graduate from your college, you're, you're hopefully going to get a job? That's what you hope for. Yep. And that's why you spend all this money yep. to go to school, hoping that you'll get a job. Is there a guarantee? No. But you have faith to believe that after you go to school, hopefully you'll get a job. Yep. And that job will hopefully help you to find someone because they'll be impressed by your job and you can actually take care of yourself. You'll get a house, maybe get married, and have 2.5 kids. Everyone has faith, guys. The question is, what is your faith in? Are you with me here? And so, we're going to take a look here at some characteristics of true faith this morning by examining our brother, Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. Point number one is Abraham had an obedient faith. An obedient. Obedience is a characteristic of faith. We're going to take a look here and see why. Genesis 12, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left. It doesn't, it doesn't say, well, Abram's like, well, uh, what? <laughs> leave? What do you mean leave? I got, I got everything settled down here. What do you mean leave? leave? So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was only 25, right? How old was he? 75! This wasn't some young buck. He said, Abram was 75 when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated. You know, over time, you accumulate a lot of stuff. You know? Yeah, man. I was going to go there, but I got myself back. And the people that had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham traveled the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moraine at Sheshem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel in the west and I in the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. All right, let's stop here. Point number one, Abraham had an obedient faith. What does this passage teach us about Abraham's obedience that came from his faith? Well, first thing you see here is that he left everything to follow God. He left everything to obey God. Guys, this is huge. Does this remind you of the scriptures in Luke 14, if you're a disciple here? Right? Guys, he left his country. He left his relatives. He left everything to obey the word of God. Guys, that example reminds me of Jesus' admonishment to us. Remember Luke 14, 33? Right? Anyone who does not give up everything. Come on. Let the Bible speak. You know, if you're a guest here, you may think that I'm saying this myself. So I want you to see from the Word of God. Because if you know your Bibles, you know what I'm talking about. But let's let the Bible speak. Luke 14, 33. Let's see what Jesus has to say. Jesus here is speaking. And he's sitting here. He's talking to the crowds here. 
And he says in Luke 14, 33, in the same way any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. There is no leeway there. You cannot. In the same way, you can't get married to someone and say, hey, I still got someone else on the side. You gotta give up everything. All the numbers, all the one night stands, all the flirtations, yep. you gotta burn the bridge and give it up. Amen. That's how we honor the ones we're gonna marry. Yep. Well then, awesome. why is it that when it comes to getting married to God, we still are so worldly? We can be worldly, guys. And then we stop thinking the way God wants us to think. And we try to hold on to the things of this world. So we're like, one foot in the world, and one foot in the kingdom. You cannot do that. And that's why the religious world has gotten so hypocritical today. I thank God for this church. I truly believe that every brother and sister in here who's desiring to be a true disciple is holy. But it, it takes that discipling, it takes a conviction. But I grew up going to church where people are kind of like, yeah, I go to church, and yeah, I'm sleeping with my boyfriend. So what? God still loves me. Really? Really? Maybe that's why you're going to have a divorce in 10 years. See, we, we can't mock God. When you do stuff like that, you're mocking God. And God will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. It's hilarious, man. You, you look at all these shows on TV. I just saw the BET Image Awards. I was watching the other day. And it's like, you look at all this stuff, and I'm like, hey, man, I, I'm, I'm proud of my new being brothers and sisters, but there, there is... There, there, there is some stuff. I'm like, there's a certain culture where they try to go, they, they try to talk about God, but at the same time, they are worldly as all get up. That kind of upsets me. Actually, no, it ticks me off because there's this there's this form of godliness, but they deny His power. It's a wickedness. You know, we got to see here, guys. Abraham had an obedient faith. You can't say, I'm faithful to God. Yes, I love my Jesus. And then not obey his words. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. And we're going to get to the second point here. You're going to see how Abraham had to learn. <clears throat> but we have to be willing to give up everything in order to be his disciple. So the first thing here in regards to obedience is he left everything to obey God. He burned his bridges. But number two, Abraham gave no excuses. Guys, he had every excuse in the book. He's 75 years old. Let the man grow old and die already. Right? He's 75. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yes, you can. People say, well, I'm, 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 I'm used to what I do. I'm, I'm in my tradition. I'm in... I think sometimes we made me look at our parents. So good to have Joyce here with us today, Erica's mom. Amen. We may look at our parents, we look at older folks and say, you know what? I don't know if they could change. They're too set in their ways. Well, according to me here, Abraham, at 75 years old, didn't make excuses and he obeyed God. That's faith. It was powerful. The other day, my dad called me. And um, we were just talking. And uh, talking about his relationship with his fiance. It was Valentine's Day. And he was considering some things. And I was like, Dad, have you, um, have you gotten any counseling in your relationship? I was like, he's like, no. Like, Dad, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to, to call up Ken and share. You guys, I want you guys to have dinner with them. Have you called him? He called? He said, he, he called my Ken and said, listen, we need to get together for some counseling. I, want, I need help in my relationship. so much for admonishing me to get help, because he was just close to wanting to kind of turn things around the way. And I was like, Dad, you know what, before we do anything, let's get some, some thinking, you know, to get in there, work with the marriage counseling, then start getting on both with God right there. I mean, the plan is working. But he was so grateful. I still believe my dad's going to turn 80 years old. Come on. March 14th. I am begging God that he will become a disciple before he dies. And so I am 
haven't given up on my dad. I have not been. Have you given up? No. Don't, don't you think just because people are old, they can't change? They can't change. Maybe they need to be a little humble right there. But they can change. I think the key thing, though, we got to realize is that Abraham, he gave no excuses. And again, you know, he's 75. It's inconvenient to move your family and possessions. I mean, guys, this, this is before the days of cruise control Penske trucks and, and air conditioning. Like, it's rough. You, your wife, your family, and we're going to just go. Here we go. But he didn't turn back. You know? And he wasn't half-hearted like the disciples back in Luke 9. Oh, we'll follow you wherever you go. Um, and so, what do we see about Abraham's obedience? Number one, he left everything to obey God. Number two, he made no excuses. What are the excuses in our life that we're using to say why we can't obey God? Uh -huh. It's so hard! Of course it's hard. <laughs> If it wasn't hard, you wouldn't be able to be, I mean, yes, if, 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 if it was easy, everybody could do it. Yes. It's like the Olympians. Oh, it's so hard. Work. Yeah, that's why there's only a few Olympians. <laughs> and sadly, that's why there's only a few true disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. See, to be a true Christian, you are an Olympian. Yes. Why? Because your goal is not what you think is right. It's what Jesus thinks is right. Yeah. You are aiming for perfection. Right. Yeah. See, the world looks at Christianity and they say, well, you know, God loves me, so I don't have to really work that hard. I can really just, you know, yeah, I sin, but so what? Of course, I'm a sinner. No. What does Olympian do? Yeah, of course, I'm weak. I'm not, I'm not a machine. But I'm going to go, I'm going to aim for perfection. I'm aiming for the 10. I'm aiming to be the best. For them, it's ultimately to glorify Maybe it's partly themselves, but also to glorify their country where they're from. Why do we do it? We're trying to glorify God. Yeah. Trying to glorify His kingdom. We are the spiritual Olympians, guys. Yeah. Don't water down the standards. No. Don't think, well, you know what? There are some people that claim to be Olympians, and they say they're Olympians, but they're really not. Wow. Remember, there was a guy... Um, in our former fellowship one time that tried to say that he was an Olympian. And all of a sudden, you know, people were like, well, aren't you practicing? Why aren't you practicing? Why aren't you doing this stuff? Come to find out, he never really was. Guys, what excuses do you have in regards to being a true disciple of Jesus Christ? And the last thing here is that, as far as obedient faith, is that Abraham didn't even have a destination. Uh, do you notice? He just said, hey, Leave your country, your people, your brother's household, and go to the land I'll show you. Go to the land I'll show you. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's intense right there. So you, you, you get everything together, you get your little caravan, and you're like, okay, God, give me a spiritual GPS. Where do I go? Where do I go? Guys, this is huge. Why do we obey? It says here. It's interesting. Um, it reminds me of... Uh, the angel in Acts 8, who tells Philip, hey, just go start walking down the desert road. Yeah. Right? He didn't tell him, he just start walking down the desert road. What happens? He meets the Ethiopian eunuch. And from there, the a Africa is evangelized. And that's pretty incredible right there. I think sometimes, we're like, unless we have to, do, 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 I will obey. Amen. We've got to have this, like, ten-point plan with everything laid out for us to obey. That's not faith. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. Are you with me here? Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11 again. Because, you know, I mean, again, some of us are left brain, some of us are right brain type of people. Some of us are like, woo, let's do anything. Yeah, I'm not carefree. Go. Other of us are like, we must follow this rule. We must follow this plan. We must do this. Stick to the plan. And the truth of it is, it's a combination of both. It's a balance. Because if you always stick to the plan, you're never flexible. And you, you really don't have a vision. You, 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 anything new happens, stop! You know, you, you can't handle adversity and issues. You freak out. But then with the people that are on the other side, like, woo, let's just go carefree, whatever. You can go carefree right off a cliff because you don't really plan out what's going on. And you're too carefree and rash. Some of y'all laughing a little too hard there. So, Hebrews 11 here. Hebrews 11, verse 8. Let's see what the Bible is telling us here. To determine what we're seeing here. He 
Hebrews 11, verse 8, chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, again, by faith. It's faith that motivated the action. See, we gotta check our we gotta check our motives there. If it's not faith that motivates the action, then maybe it's pride. But I want to see, I want people to see what I'm doing. Versus my faith in the power of God. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, <coughs> whose architect and builder is God. You know, I look at this passage and I ask myself, well, why do we obey? Because we're trying to build God's city. We're trying to build God's kingdom, His church. You with me here, guys? The church built and constructed by God. The last key component here of Abraham's obedient faith was his willingness to make his worship of God his number one priority. If you look, if you flip back to Genesis 12 here, it's pretty cool. I just want to, I just want to show you the word of God this morning. Come on, man. If you take a look here in Genesis chapter 12, verse 8, the Bible says, From there he went on to all these places, pitched his tent. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. The first thing he did when he arrived was what? Built an altar to honor God. He built an altar to worship God. Does that remind you of Matthew 6.33? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Guys. You know, I've been personally encouraged to see this kind of obedient faith imitated right here in God's kingdom in New York City. And you know, we don't have anyone specifically 75 yet. I don't think so. But we got some people in the 50s. And I appreciate that. Um, because there were no people in the 50s or late 40s before I got here. But when Patrick and I got here, there were no shepherds. No shepherds in the church. I was like, we need to get some shepherds up here. And so I remember calling up the gents, calling up the O'Donnell, saying, guys, we need you. We're going to build a, a God's kingdom here in New York City. We need some maturity. We need some, we need kind of a, some, some mom and dads in the church right here. Come on, Come on Cheryl. And you know, I appreciate this because they were obedient because of their faith. Now, mind you guys, I'm talking about sacrifice. Remember, when you're like a campus student saying, Woo, let's go to the mission team. Yeah! Okay. When you're established, you got your medical practice, you got your house that you built, taken care of, you're living, and you know, you're comfortable, everything's going great. You got your son in school with the O'Donnell, same thing. Six figure salaries, everything going great. You're good, your daughter's in school, happy. And this brother calls you up. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Mike. Bro, you remember you talked about moving to New York City once? Really? Yeah, oh, I do remember that. Yeah, I guess uh, we're going to build New York City into a pillar church, and, and then uh, you'd help oversee administration. You remember even we talked and dreamed about you going into the ministry for administration? <laughs> yeah, I do remember that, bro. <laughs> I will come. I will take up my family and we will come. Remember we called the gents like, guys, we, we want a couple to be able to disciple our marriage to be in there. We, we, need, we need people to help mature and guide and shift the church. Comfortable. Doing well in D.C. I just moved from Delaware. Their son in a magnet school. Making money. Nice house. We will come. Guys, yeah. obedient faith, giving up the money, giving up the comfortability, giving it all up. Why? For the sake of the kingdom. You need to be a lot more grateful for what the Jens and O'Donnells have done for this church. Let me tell you right now. You know, I want to hold up more of you guys. I, some of us moved here 
in order to be able to build up this church. We moved 3,000 miles. 3,000 miles. I remember when Josh was chosen in LA to come on over. It was Josh, it was the Pedicans, it was the, it was the Spences. Came on over. Came on over to say, hey, listen, what can we do to help strengthen New York City church? It's gone through a tough time. We will get new jobs again, find new places to live again, to build up God's kingdom. Are we grateful? You know what I'm talking about right there? Yeah, we're in the fourth church. We're going to go. Syracuse, D.C., L.A., let's go. Now it's time for New York City. Little baby in tow, six months old. It's crazy. I still have the picture of us and the Adams with little Naomi there, six months old. Now, Isaiah is older than Naomi when, she, when we first came here. It's crazy. And so I, I just stand in awe of what God is doing. And I also want to hold up the people that have come and obey God's word because of their faith, like the Rivera's. Yeah. 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 We're not going to sit in a lukewarm situation in our former fellowship, even though it would be a lot easier to stay out there on Long Island. Yeah. We're going to drive in an hour and a half to be here, to hear the word of God, be a part of a church where everyone's called to discipling, called to be sold out for God. Oh. Obedient faith. For you young disciples, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, what will you be doing? Maybe you'll remember this message. You'll remember these people. And you'll call yourself to be like Jesus. And give up everything all over again. You know, um, obviously we see that with Jacob Megan Studer. Amen, guys? <laughs> Like, you know, Andrew, after I told you last week how he talked to his bosses, and they were like, hey man, we saw this coming. You, you're like, you know, now we gotta figure out who's gonna be the moral compass for our, you know, our company now. Wow. But what was really cool was that this week apparently, you know, there was this guy that was kind of vying for his job. And he, he was so prideful about it that the people were like, you know what? No, you're not getting this job. Hey Jake, listen, can you keep how much can you how much can you keep doing while you're in Toronto? Wow. Awesome, bro. They're like, I'm about 95%. You know what? We're going to keep you on as a consultant. Are you eager to obey, or do you struggle with rebellion? 
Are you obeying out of reverence for God and reverence for the grace of God? Or are you obeying because of the guilt trip of men? I'm not here to give you a guilt trip this morning. I'm here to inspire you by the grace of God. And if you're, if you're obeying out of duty instead of grace, then you're not obeying out of faith. And God will not be pleased. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. It says here, You foolish men, verse 20, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And that his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture that was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Period. Why do churches out there teach? All you gotta do, just believe you become a Christian. Nonsense. The first word of the gospel in Mark 1 was, Jesus said, repent and believe. You gotta change. You gotta repent. Your, your faith and actions are working together. It's like breathing. <sighs> They're working together. If you just have faith. That's why repentance is important. But not just in actions, but also in our hearts. Amen? Let's continue our case study of Abraham here. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Abraham had an obedient faith. Point number two, Abraham had a growing faith. This is important. Because I think sometimes, you know, we talk about aiming for, for, for perfection. But the truth is, we're not perfect. We blow it. And we get so afraid of blowing it sometimes that we end up doing nothing. That's the worst thing you can do. Are you with me here? Well, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12 here, point number two, Abraham had a growing faith. Let's see how Abraham had to grow. Genesis 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Say, you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken, taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham required sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham, what have you done to me, he said. Why did you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here's your wife, take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abraham about Abraham to his men, they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Okay, let's stop here. What the mess just happened? What the mess just happened? Okay, hold on a second here. What's the point? Abraham had ruined faith, right? Despite his conviction to obey God immediately, right? He said, Amen, God, I'm going to right? Abraham still had a lot of harm to do, right? He struggled with selfishness and pride. What do you see here? Right? <coughs> First of all, it's interesting because um, there's a famine in the land and Abraham goes down to Egypt. But hold on a second. Didn't God say, I'm going to give this land to you? Yeah. But because you feel, because there's some famine, now you decide to go somewhere else. Wow. Right? And so basically we see here that he didn't trust God's promises. Well, there's a famine. Maybe, maybe you don't trust God's promises. 
Maybe you say, you know, sisters, ah, there's a famine here, brothers. I, I don't see a brother I, I don't want to marry yet. Maybe I should go to the world to find one. <laughs> brothers, maybe, maybe you say, well, I don't know. There's a famine. Oh, well, there's a famine in my job. Yeah, there's a famine here at my job, so I need to go find another job. That, even though it meets on Sundays and Wednesdays, I need to go do that instead. He wasn't trusting God's plan. And then, you see here that his wife, he straight out tells his wife, hey, listen, you know what? Yeah, you're, you're beautiful, you know. You know, you're awesome. But because you're awesome, I'm kind of scared for me because they may want to kill me to get you. So, you know what? Just tell them you're my sister because that will protect me. He straight out, and then Pharaoh gets word about this and he's like, yeah, you're right. Sure, you're right. Can we get Actually, yeah, you need to come on up in my house. Become my concubine. Abraham straight up pimped out his wife. Now, I have to do some study on this. I'm like, Abraham? Abraham, you are really tripping here. What is this? How do you not tell somebody that she is in your wife? And then the guy takes her in, and then the Lord's like, mm mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He inflicts serious diseases. You wonder why there's so many STDs today? You know, back in the day in the 60s, it was like maybe or 50s, maybe like three or so disease STDs. Today, it's like 27. God's like, you know what? I will inflict some diseases upon you. Now, I studied out the commentary, and most scholars believe this. The thing is, if he had kids through her, then the whole thing with Abraham's line would be jacked up, so that, that couldn't have worked out. It looks like God stopped it just in time, that he didn't actually have sex with her. But that she did come to be part of his harem. So I'm like, whoo, Abraham, you left out right there, boy. But still, though, you straight up pimped out your wife. Well, how do you know he pimped out his wife? Well, what happened? He got all this stuff. In verse 16 it says, He treated Abram well for his sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants, maid servants, camels. Like when you get married, right, you give, like, you know, basically, if you was the father or, or brother, you're giving your sister, you get a dowry from the guy who wants to take the woman. So basically, he got money for Sarai. Wow. Wow. So what do we see here? Even though you can want to be righteous, sometimes you go do really dumb stuff. This is a big one. Right? I mean, this is probably like, you think about, I think for us, we got to realize, sometimes we wonder, can God really use me? I'm too, I'm too sinful. I'm too wicked. All you got to do is think about Abraham. Right? God used David, who was an adulterer and murderer. Noah was a drunk, and Abraham was a pimp. This is intense. <laughs> if God can use these people, he can use you. Are you with me here, guys? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I don't feel like saying I have to have stuff going on in my life. Stop it. God can use you. God can work through you. I, only, I can only imagine what happened after you guys arrived back. Oh it was a these serious marriage. <laughs> you left me! <laughs> Whoa! And he's like, well, baby, look at all these stuff I got for you. <laughs> Job celebrating Cassell's birthday yesterday. Um, she encouraged the mess out of it. It was a whole Star Wars theme. She dressed up like Princess Leia. That was it. Padme, excuse me. Who was, who was it? Was it Julia dressed up like Princess Leia? She dressed up like Padme. I still got pictures. And so it was cool because I came in with my old Jedi outfit too. Hey man, got stopped by the police and everything. I'm walking to the party, okay? And mind you, I, I'm like, this is a Star Wars party. What, what do I put on? I'm like, all right, fine. I see they look like they have some type of 
martial arts outfit. So I just put on my white gi that I had, put on my belt and stuff, and then I had like a sweatshirt that I put, I put the sweatshirt on, then the gi, so I had this hoodie on, big hood. Then I had this long, like matrix-like trench coat. And so then I had my umbrella, it looks like a sword, you ever see the one? Fierce. I mean, it was like, pretty fierce. And so I'm like, should I drive to this party? I like, oh, I should drive. No, I'll walk. It'd be nice. So I'm walking, and you know, as you're walking, I, and, you know, the hood is like covering you, and so people are looking at me like, and so, and so I'm like five blocks away, and all of a sudden, as this guy kind of comes out of the corner, he's like, oh, sir, can you walk me to the wall, please? Oh, like, you know, it's kind of a little dude. But, but then I saw the, the police, um, he was the undercover, he had a police bag on him. And I'm, so, it's funny because I didn't say anything at first, I just kind of looked at him. Because <laughs> he didn't say, you know, the cops or whatever. So I'm like, I, mean, I was ready to do what I had to do, you know? And so, and so he's like, sir, uh, but he was very blessed. I'm like, sir, uh, can I see your, uh, see what's, what that is? Because he's looking at my umbrella. But mind you, it, it's like, if you were, if you didn't know, it looked like a sword. It's like in a sheet and stuff. Yeah. So I was about to show it, he's like, well, sir, 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 take, 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 take. <laughs> and I'm like, well, see, you can see it's an umbrella, right? And uh, he's like, Think you have a weapon in my mind jumping stuff like hey man i was like thank you so much for trying to keep us safe you know i, I felt really i was like wow this is new york city we're safe this is awesome <laughs> i like these other covers because they're, they're cool man you don't even know we've been chilling with the hoodies all of a sudden they're, <laughs> they're in a taxi <laughs> they're creeping up on you hey man all right now we're gonna get back on track so you know it's cool because i, I think for us the good news is that, despite the fact you may get way off track, kind of like Abraham here, there's always an opportunity to repent. Take a look over in Acts chapter three. You know, I want to encourage you this morning, maybe there's some sin in your life that, man, you know what? It's going after you. And you feel like you can't overcome it. I, I want to encourage you guys. It's your decision to decide to <laughs> repent every day. It's not like lust and greed and deceit and pride are just going to magically leave you tomorrow. It's a daily decision to decide to repent. Are you with me? Yeah. And so in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Paul and Peter here speaking to the crowd, he says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. See, look, the key thing here is that your sins don't get wiped out unless you what? Repent. you got to repent first. A lot of people say, no, I get saved the moment I believe. That is, that's not what this scripture says. Oh, Repent, then turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. You still got to get baptized. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. See, when you repent, then you can have the refreshing. If you're wondering why you're not at peace, if you're wondering, man, this is so hard, it's because you haven't repented. And that's why you're not refreshed. Are you with me here? Don't you want to be refreshed this morning? Yes. Yeah. You just got to decide what you got to repent of. Maybe it's just your faith. Maybe it's not necessarily the things you're doing. Maybe it's just your faith that brings you that peace. Amen, guys? Are oh, you really rededicating yourself to God? Because if you go back to Genesis here, what did, what did Abraham have to do after he tried to pimp out his wife here? I'm, I'm, I'm a little hard on Abraham right now. I'm not saying he really was a pimp. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> But yeah, he did do it again, kind of, sort of later. But, but here, and in Genesis 13, it says, Now Abram went up from Egypt to the Geb with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. Mind you, he wasn't wealthy before. Or like that, anyway, until. Let me tell you what. Um, and then, <laughs> what's, what's interesting about all this? 
is that um, in verse 3 it says, From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel. So the place between Bethel and I where his tent had been earlier. So he went back to where he had originally started, where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Amen. So he repented. You repent, guys? Amen. That's good. Right? So the key thing there is that even though you can go and vote big time, you gotta remember the things you did at first. You gotta go back, repent, so that you can be refreshed. Amen, guys? And that's why we get we gotta continue to grow in our faith. We never stop growing, guys. We never stop growing. I don't care whether you've been a Christian 5, 10, 15, 30, 50 years. It well, amen. Probably dead by then. But the point of it is that, oh, you could be 50 years and be back and baptized at 15 or whatever. And so, but how is it going, growing in your faith today? Are you, are you more faithful today than you were last week, yes. last year? Yes. And of course, God is going to test you in that to see where you are. You with me here, guys? Second Peter chapter 1. Very interesting here because the Bible lays it out that we should be growing in our faith. Second Peter chapter one. Let's start to close out here. Second Peter chapter one. It says here in verse five, for this very reason, make every effort to what? Add to your faith. Goodness. And to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, Godliness and the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want to be effective and productive? Then you got to ask yourself here well, how are you making every effort to add to your faith? The, the Greek here literally means supply in your faith. And what's powerful about this is that, you know, goodness, goodness, knowledge, are you growing? You know, we have a great book table here, provided by the Riveras. Yeah. Are you, I remember when I was a baby Christian, I couldn't wait to save up some money to get a new book. To get some deeper insights, to learn more. And now today, it's the envy of many. And so the, the key thing is, but the truth of it is, is that that library I've been building I've read the books. And so when you hear a sermon, it's not a sermon just by whatever sermon. It's a sermon based on almost 15 years. Studying, applying, figuring out how... how it, it, it's, I once heard a guy talk about the fact that this preacher preached a sermon, and he's like, bro, that sermon was amazing. Best sermon I've ever heard. How long did it take you to do that? He's like, 40 years. Because sometimes we think, oh, these sermons are just like, no. It's a life of application, a life of practice. Are you growing in your faith <coughs> so that you can live a disciplined life? Right? It's a good book there, bro. But that knowledge, not self-control. Are you growing in your self-control? Brothers, in your purity. Are you getting more sensitive to your purity? Sisters, are you getting more sensitive to, uh, maybe it's your Amen. speech. Maybe it's bitterness, maybe, maybe whatever. Are you growing in these things? But then it goes on, um, self-control, because you shouldn't have the same self-control a year ago than you do today. Right. Are you with me here? Yeah. Right. right? You shouldn't be struggling. Like maybe last year you struggled with wanting to check out Sports Illustrated on the internet. This year, whatever. You're going to get close to that. Right. Come on, bro. Come on. You with me here? Yeah. Are you growing in your faith? Growing in your self-control? Maybe last year you struggled, oh, I was about to curse there, but this year, cursing doesn't even come into my mind. Um, perseverance. Are you growing in perseverance? Last year, yeah, man, when, when missions came around, it was a struggle. I felt like I was bench pressing 300 pounds. This year, yeah, I already planned. I got missions done with my taxes. Oh, man, bro. God's like, good, now I can add a little more weight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you growing in your person? Do you see what I'm saying here, guys? This is stuff you got to look at and ask yourself. Am I becoming more kind to my brothers? Am I becoming more loving? Remember, loving doesn't mean nice. More patient, more kind, more self-controlled. Are we growing in our walk with God? 
These are the qualities, guys. Because honestly, if we're not, then we won't be effective and we won't be productive, i.e. we won't be fruitful. Wow. That's most here, guys. Because I, I think the key thing for us is, you know, our faith does not stand on a plateau. Either we're growing or we're deteriorating. It's one way or the other. And you got to have a deep conviction that, you know what, that's why I have my time with God. Because I'm going to grow today. I'm going to make this happen. Amen? Let's go back to Genesis here and close the last point. Abraham had an obedient faith. He had a growing faith. But he also had a trusting faith. This is huge. Well, here, back in Genesis, we see here that Abraham gets his wife back. Amen. And uh, long story short, what was interesting here is that he had his nephew, Lot, who was also moving with him, but the land that they had uh, could not support them because they had so much stuff. So he basically tells um, Lot, you know what, bro? Wherever you want to take, you take that, and I'll take the opposite. He just had a heart that said, you know what, man? You know, I trust God. Whatever, whatever you want to do, you take that, I'll take the other half. What's really interesting, though, is that Lot decided to take the beautiful land of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abram, it, it, it would become Sodom and, you know, the Sodom and Gomorrah we know, that's what it would become, right? But Abraham focused on God's promises. There, it was pretty awesome. Um, if, you, if you look in uh, Genesis 13, it basically says here, Verse 5, Now Lot was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land did not support them while they were staying together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abraham's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt towards Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. And so, you see here, it's pretty intense right here. Lot, he's focusing on the superficial. Abraham focused on God's promises. We've got to really check ourselves about our, our trust. Because sometimes we're like, do you really trust that God's going to get us through things? Even when they don't necessarily look um, like it's going to be great. I'm giving up the best here to my nephew Lot. But you know what? I trust God is going to take care of me no matter what. That, that's powerful right there. And so, it goes on in chapter 14. The second time, I'm going to kind of um, sum this up. And so, this war breaks out between these four powerful kings in the east against these five minor Palestinian kings. And Lot is captured. He just happened to be in that land that he thought was so beautiful and so awesome. Well, guess what? Now war came to it. You with me here? And in the midst of war, Lot is captured. And Abraham hears about this. And he goes and rescues his nephew. He goes and rescues his nephew. It says in uh, Genesis 14, verse 14, When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went and pursued as far as Dan. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them, and he routed them. You never thought of Abraham as a warrior, huh? Abraham was a warrior, too. He could throw down. Right? It says here, pursuing him as far as Hobad, north of Damascus, he re recovered all the goods, brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, to be together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating um, Kedor Lamor and the kings of Lydon Pen, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought up bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. 
The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the people and give, keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a throng of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will, I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Anir, Eshol, and Mamer. Let them have their share. Come on. Let's stop here. That's awesome. Abraham had a trusting faith, guys. Yep. One man with an army of 318 goes against him. four major kings and takes him out. It's like Gideon. But you know, this is interesting because very often we can be intimidated by the number of non-Christians or false Christians around us. And we don't trust God's plan and trust God's word. But what's interesting too is that after the battle he meets Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which was later renamed Jerusalem, who serves as a type of Messiah. But what's interesting here is that Melchizedek blesses Abraham and God, and Abraham responds with a tithe from the war, because he beat these guys, he got money, you with me? And it's interesting to note that this tithe precedes Mosaic law. Little nugget right there. It's a great example of the heart that we need to have in our giving to trust the Lord. He gave a tithe before the whole tithe thing with Mosaic law came about. Is that pretty awesome right there? Because he trusted God. Guys, we got to get ready to give today permissions. Amen, guys? And let me tell you something. I told you last week, if you want false stuff to continue, don't give. If you want people to go on teaching that you got to pray this into your heart and chocolate, chocolate, and all that nonsense, then don't give. And if you can't give immediately, then get a plan to give. You see what I'm saying here? Talk it through. Get the help. Well, let's get, let's get a plan to make sure we can blow it out for the Lord. Amen? we got to trust God even when it's scary. Let's close out here in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, um, I hope you've been encouraged today by Abraham. I hope you've been encouraged by his obedient faith. I hope you've been kind of shouting, like, whoa, by his uh, growing faith where we need to grow. But I also think and I hope that you've been inspired by his trusting faith. Come on. That no matter what, man, he trusted God to bring him through. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, this will be our last scripture here. Too much smoke. It says here, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Guys, our goal must be to examine our faith by testing ourselves. How do we test ourselves? Well, you know what? Do we respond to God's word immediately? Or do we have an obedient faith? Is there evidence of growth in our faith? And are we really trusting God through the toughest times, through the trials? That is really where our faith is at, guys. That's when our faith is tested. You know, it was so awesome to see um, Carolina be able to go to the Central South Mission America Missions Conference. Yeah. You know, here she is. She raised the money. She raised money. She, she, she talked to her family. She's like, listen, we got to make this happen. They're like, okay, this is your graduation. This is your birthday. This is everything for us. Okay? And she raised thousands of dollars to be able to go to Santiago, Chile. Because she wanted to see what God had done. She trusted that, if, you know what, if I raise this money, I'll be encouraged. Let me tell you something right now. She came back a different woman. And here's the good news. As a result, um, you know, she's from Columbia, right? Well, guess what church is going to be planted by Jared and Rachel McGee? The Bogota Columbia Church. Now, I know they got their eye on you already. So, <laughs> but it's incredible to see that when you're obedient, when you're growing, and when you're trusting God, can you, you remember Jared McGee? Do you remember Jared McGee? Yes. And now God has used him in Santiago, Chile, to not only become an evangelist, but now go and plant a church in Bogota, Colombia? Yeah. Guys, awesome. what can God do through you? Amen. Test yourself in the faith so that it can be used by the Lord. Thank you very much. Yeah.